Do you live in Georgia? No, I live here. Oh, okay. Okay. Georgia? Why'd you say Georgia? I somebody told me. Why'd you whisper it like no one's listening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't tell anybody. Well, I have a secret friendship with Jim Goad, who's one of the few people who makes me really laugh. Even though, you know, most of the world... It's not a secret world, anymore. Most of the world <laughs> hates Jim Goad. Why do they hate Jim Goad? Um, because he writes these very transgressive, in-your-face pieces. But when he writes about his brother, he kills me. It is some of the most uh, touching stuff I've ever read in my life about his brother's death. Um, so, you know, the whole world, I think, is so fooled in that they think that Jim Goad is a bad person, and they think that maybe I'm a good person... When it's just exactly the opposite. <laughs> How are you a bad person? Oh, let's not even go down that road. I already told on Cheryl Strayed killing that bird. Come on, do I got to do more? That's not being a bad person. That's a person who's appreciative of a dark moment. That doesn't make you a bad person. No, I'm a bad person. Are you? Yeah. Really? I am. Yeah. Give me an example. You know, and this is awkward, but this is another one of those cognitive reframing honesty things is I took care of my mother while she was dying of uh, lung cancer. And even while I was taking care of her and she was lapsing in and out of consciousness in her home, there was a little part of me that felt this glee that thought, I will never have to worry about mom again. Uh, I will never have to worry about whether mom is offended by my work. I will never have to worry about mom falling down the stairs and breaking her leg. That this enormous concern in my life will be resolved. Uh, and it's going to be at the cost of losing someone I, I love, you know, so much. But the benefit is that this huge burden of responsibility is going to be lifted. And so there was this kind of secret glee, thinking, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some freedom here that I never imagined. Um, yeah, Nora Ephron touches on that in her work when she talks about her mother's death. And I think it's just a, it's an, it's an honest thing, but it's not a, a thing that makes you look very good. I don't think that makes you a bad person. I think that, that makes you a person who's honest about thoughts that are very uncomfortable. That That is just something that people think, I think, all the time, if they're dealing with someone who's completely incapacitated and, and they have to care for them 24-7, but they don't express it. It's just... It's just a, a reality of the burden of someone who's really sick or really dying. Is it, there's there's no getting around it. I don't think it's a bad. That's a, not a good example. I need a, I need an example why you're a bad person. Maybe you're just really self-critical, aware of things that other people could take out of context of the, the the totality of your life, and just use it as an example. Put it in quotes and use it as an example of you being a bad person. You know, another thing is I, I'm really really conflicted about the nature of my uh, creativity, you know, this idea that in journalism school, they, they call the theory seduce and betray, that when you go into an interview situation, your goal is to gain the trust of that person and to get them to reveal something very intimate that you're going to betray by revealing to the public. So you're, just, you're basically going in there to, to charm them and then to hurt them. And, uh, and so much of my creative process is that way because, uh, for example, the, the, the gut story, mm -hmm. the, the, the story in which the guy puts the carrot up his butt, that was my best friend at the time in like late 20s. And he got fantastically drunk and he told me that carrot story. And I honestly believe he had never told anybody the carrot story. And I, I kept that story in my mind for, you know, 10, 15, almost probably 20 years until I found a way to put it with three similar stories and make a, a larger piece out of it. And the first time I read that story, I hadn't seen him in maybe a couple of years, this friend. And I look across this big auditorium and there he is. And I'm telling his carrot story in front of hundreds and hundreds of people. 
And the look on his face, he's just stricken. <laughs> and he hasn't talked to me since. <laughs> and this is why even, even <sighs> David... But did you use his name? No. Then fuck him. No, but... What's wrong with him? St- people still feel betrayed. And- ah, get over it. You need to hang out with more comedians. If he was a comic, he'd be laughing. Well, you know, D- David Sedaris has, has told me, he said his family is very reluctant to share their lives with him anymore <laughs> because he's kind of made them involuntary public figures and they have to deal with the fallout yeah. with, from these stories about them. And really only his brother and his sister Amy have kind of been able to spin this in a good way. But uh, it alienates a lot of people. Oh, for sure. Well, especially if you use their actual name or people know mm. the origin of the actual story. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, you're not a bad person. Sorry. Sorry to break it to you. Mm. Think you're a bad person. Those are the only examples. You're not convinced. No, no, I'm just not revealing the worst stuff. Okay, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that you have to have some sort of embracing of these dark thoughts to create the way you create? I mean, you're creating these characters that go down some horrible roads, both mentally and in reality, in in your work. And it's amazing stuff, but to cultivate that, don't you think you have to be kind of in touch with those thoughts of your own? To kind of in touch with this you know, this thing where you're watching your mom die and you, you are going to be relieved of a burden. And you don't want to tell anybody that you're kind of looking forward to that a little bit, even though you love your mom dearly. This, that's a natural thing that people don't want to discuss, but absolutely exists. It's the elephant in the room. And, and that's kind of like how comedy works or, or anything where you're stating this unstated thing. You're creating this enormous relief. Uh, uh, my classic example when I teach, I, I ask my students, I say, so, so what do you call a black man that flies a plane? A pilot, you fucking racist. <laughs> <laughs> you're creating this tension. Right. They don't want you to say what they think you're going <laughs> to say. They don't want to hate you. They like you. Right. And they don't want you to say something hateful and awful. Yeah. And then you turn it around and you put it on them. Um, and so in a way, you know, I always think that's the, the soul of comedy is to create this, this tension that you relieve as quickly as possible. And the relief occurs as laughter. I was having dinner with uh, a good friend of mine, his wife and a buddy of mine, and my friend's friend and his wife and fun time the whole night everybody's laughing and joking and or having dinner and uh, having a couple of drinks and joking around talking about things and i forget what led to him saying this but we were talking about Oh, just unfortunate scenarios and, you know, people that just their life is not going the way they'd like it to go and things going bad. And out of nowhere, the guy goes, well, it's like this. My daughter has uh, she had a baby with a black man. And we're we're both like looking at him like, where is this going? And then he goes. And, uh, you know, I just think it's incredibly selfish to bring that kid into the world. And this kid doesn't have an identity. They're not black and they're not white. And they don't, they're, they're not going to have an identity. They're not going to have a group to belong to. And my friend's jaws dropped. My, I didn't know the guy. I just met him that night. And my dropped, and I looked at my other friend who was with me who didn't know any of these other people. And, and everyone's like, what the fuck? And then a couple of us get up and go to the bathroom, and I turned to my friend Andrew, and I said, let's get the fuck out of here. And we just left, and I texted my friend. I go, too much racism, had to go. And we just left. And, uh, but it was so weird. It's like this guy was holding into this, and he's like, you know what, I can trust these people with some racist shit. I can trust them, and it didn't work. And he knew it didn't work. Like, <laughs> he knew it went over. <laughs> the world, like a lead balloon. He knew it, he could feel it, because everybody was like, what? Like, wait a minute. 
your daughter is in love with a man who's <laughs> black. They have a child together, and you think it's incredibly selfish to bring that kid into the world. Like, what the fuck? I wish I could remember what the fuck we were talking about before then. But what we were talking about before then was like drug addicts or people who fuck up or, you know, people who are addicted to gambling or something. You know, people are, whose lives were in chaos. And then he brings up his daughter having a baby with a, a guy who has the wrong amount of melanin in his skin. Whose ancestors came from the wrong part of the world for him. It was weird, man. It was, we it was weird also to see him recognize I, I, it's funny, you know, you throw out a story, I throw out a story. Uh, I, I had a hired car from Philadelphia to New York once on, on tour. And uh, as we we're going past Liberty Hall in Philadelphia, this, this great guy with a Philly accent driving the car, he points at Liberty Hall and he says, that building has stood for, you know, 300 years. I bet you can't tell me why. And I just looked and I said, because the, the bricks are laid in Flemish bond. I think that's probably it, where the, the, the brick bricks are offset in such a way that they, they bond in the center. It's called Flemish bond. And the guy's so silent. Nobody's ever answered the question. And his father was a bricklayer, and he was so proud. And he goes, you're right. Nobody's ever said Flemish bond. That's why it still stands. And we were best friends. And... Just talking like crazy all the way into Manhattan. We get into Manhattan. There's two guys walking down the street. The guy goes, oh, Christ, I hate coming to New York. Ah, oh, the fags. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I'm married to a man. And faggot is pretty much my middle name. <laughs> and that poor guy had to do oh. this whole so Dance. Rejuggling of everything that the guy who knew Flemish Bond was also one of them. Oh. And it was one of those wonderful kind of uh, icky but necessary moments. And, uh, you know, they're horrible, but, you know, things are better afterwards. You so. must have loved that moment, though. Mm -hmm. You? you no, know, it was a horrible moment because I felt like I was throwing away any kind of chatty conversational relationship i had with this guy mm. he seemed like just a salt of the earth great funny guy and it was just <sighs> kind of going out on a limb and saying okay you know he's gonna hate my guts after this so when i was a little kid we lived in san francisco from age uh, seven to eleven and then moved to florida which is the polar opposite of san francisco and uh, uh i'd i really i don't know if I'd ever heard someone use the word faggot before, but I'd never seen a, an adult upset about gay people before. And then uh, my friend Candy, Candido was his name. Um, his dad was Cuban. They were Cuban. And uh, his dad slams the newspaper on the, on the table. I was 11. And he's like, I can't believe they're letting these fags get married. He was just so angry. And I remember stopping and thinking, like, here, Here's a, a man. This guy's a man. He's a grown man. Like he's a grown up. But yet he's he's got this infant idea of what a person should be. Like they, they got to fall into this category, that category. He's got it locked into his head. He's a fucking baby, but he's a man and he's my friend's dad. Mm -hmm. This guy so this guy made it to 35 years old or whatever the fuck he was. And this is his uh, this is his operating system that he's using to navigate his way through life. I remember it being an important moment for me because I realized like just because someone's older doesn't mean they learned anything, mm. you know, and that, that people are capable of success in life. You know, you could become married, you can have children, you get a house, you get a good job, you drive a car, the whole thing, you got it all. You've, you've got a checkbook, you got a fucking, you, you're, you're, you're operating, it's moving, you're successful, it's happening. And yet you still have these stupid ideas. You know, but I think there, there, there's, uh, there's a benefit to the expression of the stupid idea. Not that it, they're going to be challenged, but that at least we're, we're aware that it's there. Yeah. And that, you know, we know that this thing is not just kind of festering and that there's a way of kind of not fixing this person, but at least we know where they're coming from. Yeah. You know, it, oh, another shooting myself in the career foot. 
thing. I don't think you've done it once the whole show. Okay, here it goes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I read the Daily Stormer. Whoa. Because <laughs> Andrew Anglin cracks me up. Who is that? He is the completely transgressive guy who really loves Fight Club. And oh, wow. he writes for the Daily Stormer. I think he is the Daily Stormer. And he writes the most atrocious, insensitive, uh, brutal things. But they are, they're so shocking and so transgressive that, uh, that sometimes I laugh just out of the shock. You know, uh, the old classic joke, how do you get a nun pregnant? You fuck her. You know, there's a shock value there that that just sort of jars me and makes me laugh sometimes. That joke would have worked better if you hadn't told the black pilot joke first. Oh, well, of course. The problem is, like, people become, a, you know, you know what's coming. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but sometimes, you know, I, I want to go into uh, a world where people are not watching their language so closely. Mm. and And I see people kind of... Uh, vent the worst of themselves right and I, i'm not kind of endorsing it but i feel a little less reactive to abuse uh, scientologists has have this exercise called bull baiting where they take you into a room and people surround you and they call you every horrible thing and then they they nitpick hor- every aspect of your appearance or your your character who you are and they attack you on every level and they do this for long, long periods of time, and they do this day after day until you are completely not reactionary to that kind of verbal abuse. You can, you can put it over there. You can accept the fact that it's somebody else's statement, somebody else's opinion, observation, that it's not true, and you can be with it. And so in a way, when I go into these sites that are so patently offensive and, and deliberately, you know, aggressively offensive, I feel like, in a way, they're thickening my skin, that uh, I'm not quite uh, such a delicate little reactive thing afterwards. Do you worry about someone looking through your search results? Oh, there are far worse things than that. 